Hello, everyone. So, uh, so it was actually from uh, one uh, chapter one through eighteen, not twenty-seven, just to make it clear for you guys. So, before we begin, you know, we need a little history on James and uh, the book for whom he wrote the book for. Right. So, James himself was the younger half brother of Jesus. You know, it's safe to assume that he grew up with Jesus and that they shared a lot of memories. And James. Uh, goes from being a younger brother to looking up to just this older brother, goes up to uh, and starts and eventually, you know, starts worshiping G his older brother as God, and he realizes that he is God. And eventually, James goes to being martyred for his faith. You know, and James wrote this book for Jewish Christians who was per who were persecuted at that time. So that was his ministry. That was uh, who he spoke to, which is why we see that the first chapter of James. Uh, is about trials and temptations. So if we can throw up the aim, the first slide. So the aim for today is trials will come, so count them as count them all as joy because God is good. And the questions we ask ourselves is what is your current perspective of your trials? Right? Where are you fearful? And how can you turn turn your trials to triumphs. How are we reflecting Jesus when people see us in our trials? Are we reflecting him at all? As we begin to read James, we see that James, inspired by the Spirit, has the same method uh, that Jesus uses to teach biblical truth truths to us throughout the Bible. You know, and every time we read, he introduces he likes to use paradoxes. You know, what is a paradox? Can we throw the next slide? So it's a situation or a person or a thing that combines contradictory features and qualities. Jesus uses these uh, to show us deeper spiritual truths. Can we go to the next slide? And here are some examples. Oh, thank you. Uh, here are some examples that you can see. You know, he says, whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses it for my sake will find it. You know. And keep on and on, and you know, take up your daily cross and follow me. If a man, if a man strikes to you in one cheek, turn it, turn to him the other cheek also. But whoever would be great among you must be a servant, and whoever will be first among you must be a slave for all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. You know, any of these things you see are just these things that are difficult to understand, and that's where we begin today. You know, we see. So that's how James begins uh, verse 2, if we can read it. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. You know, let's stop there. Let's take, let's take 15 seconds and think, if you're in a trial right now, I want you to think about that. I want you to bring it to your front, uh, front of your mind. Or if you've been in a season of trial, I want you to take 10 seconds to think about that right now. Think about something you've gone through or are going through, right? And, and let's read this verse again. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. We have a difficult command here because not only are we to endure these trials, but we are to find joy in them. How is this possible? You know, in the midst, if you've gone through a trial or in one right now, you know that it is a painful process. It hurts. So I don't know about you, when I go through th stuff, I am not comforted by people's cliched words, right? It's like, okay, I'll just pray for you. Like, that's not enough for me. Like, don't, don't talk to me. You don't understand what I'm going through, right? And especially if a person is happy, I'm, I'm really not listening to them, right? You know, they have everything going on while I'm going through this. You don't understand what I'm going through. And I think it's a fair question for us to ask. How am I supposed to find joy in this pain? I thought joy is found in good circumstances, good things happening to us, they bring us laughter, more money, maybe a better job, good things. But to understand what James is saying, we need to consider that he'll, he'll present us two ways in which we need to look at trials and two opponents or fights that we're in, no matter which trial we're going through. And if you know, if you've ever been in a fight, I don't know if you've been in a fight, but if you're in a fight, you should know that being aware 
knowing that the fight is coming, being aware will make you more prepared to be in that fight. So let's see what James says in verse 3, right? For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James is saying that the first view of how we, the first way we should look at trials is that the Christian view trials as a pathway to maturity. And the obvious question to ask is how can trials lead to maturity, right? How can struggle lead to success? Well, let's look at our own lives. How many of you play instruments, right? How many of you uh, have high level paying jobs that are stressful? How many of you are in school working hard? In school, hopefully working hard in school, right? How many of you are proficient at those things? Did you have to stumble and fail to learn? Didn't you have to be consistent? Did anything you accomplish today that you cherish come to you easily? No. We know that it required sleepless nights, stressful work, training, practicing, falling, and getting up again. But you know that you got better, right? Anytime I see any, anybody playing any of these instruments here, I know that they worked hard at it and got better at it. You know, I heard, and I heard this really get great quote uh, uh, last, uh, last week. Uh, it's not a preacher. It's just uh, someone uh, that I listened to. And he said, ease is a greater threat to maturity than hardship. Is that ease is a greater threat to maturity than hardship. It means that what you got easily, you'll never value. What you struggle to get is always going to be worth more to you. So, and do we really believe, so when we listen to this and when we look at the examples in our lives, do we really believe that spiritual maturity will be any different? Did any of you, when you accepted Christ, gain superpowers of wisdom, patience, love, or self-control? Did we magically figure out uh, how to work out, solve all our problems, or smooth out all our relationships, and gain some kind of spiritual mastery? No, none of us. You know, we need to realize that if we are Christians, we are going to face trials. Whether you're in college, or in your workplace, or in your school, it's going to happen whether you want it to or not. So be ready, you know, be joyous, because it's going to make you better. You know, at this point you might be like, okay, I've seen this. I've seen enough movies and I've seen enough TV to know, like, that's, that's how it works, okay? Like, you struggle for a year or two, maybe you struggle two, two or three things, and then you get better, and then boom, that's fine. But why does it say trials of many kinds? Why not just two or three major things, maybe like a year's worth, I can struggle for a year, and then I should be okay. Why does it have to span my entire life? Right? And for that, we need to realize uh, that James has the answer to that too. And it has to do with the state of our hearts. And it says, because I don't know if you've noticed this. Uh, I've noticed this. When I'm in a season of trial, whereas there's in a season of prosperity or when it, everything is going well, I tend to put God on the sidelines. You know, maybe you're just busy, right? Maybe you have too many clubs too much work, too much homework, kids, and everything. And have you just been going through life sometimes, and everything is going well, and then boom, something happens, right? Something terrible happening, and something changes, and suddenly you realize, or you realize your need for God. You know, how many times have you gone through a tough situation and felt a deep desire for God to sustain you, and to give you peace because you knew nothing else could. Because the situation was just too big for yourself. Too big to handle. Think back. You know, when was it that you prayed your hardest? When do you pray your hardest? When did you fall on your knees and cry? Lock yourself in your room and just cry to God? When did you seek Him in His Word? How did you seek Him in His Word? during these times? When was the last time you even fasted for God? What was the last reason for your fast? I found that for me, I do all of these things when I'm facing something that's too big for me to overcome. Is it the same for you? You know, we face trials of many kinds because trials 
help us be consciously aware of our need for God. You know, our sinful hearts keeps, key heart keeps forgetting that we, the created beings, need our Creator to be whole. And it is, our, and it is in this weakness that proves verse 3, that maturity is a process. It is grimy and dirty and requires us to ask God for wisdom who gives generously to all without finding fault. And so the principle is here. Is that the Christian should view trials as a pathway to maturity and a reminder of our need for God. You know, what is your attitude towards trials and temptations that you might be facing right now? How might, you need, how might you need to change perspective to gain a biblical view of trials and temptations? How are you relying on God to screw you this? Are you even relying on God or are you just using your own power or your own will and hoping that, oh, if I just try hard enough, I'll get through this? You know, let's move on to verse 6. Eight. Now we come to a point where we can realize, okay, God, you know, I get this. You have to get me through this, so I'll come to you, right? Right. So you have a perspective change uh, from this part. So now, we in the first few verses, we see this perspective change. The next ones will show us the two opponents that we have, no matter what trial we're going through, right? And let's read verses uh, six through eight. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. The person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. That person should not expect anything. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So our first opponent is doubt. And we have, again, a difficult command because we are asked in this tough situation that we have that we shouldn't doubt. We should ask but not doubt because if you doubt, you're going to be double-minded. Right, because it's and we have a, we have two prayers to consider in this, and that's one is God grant me faith to trust in you and destroy my doubt, so that that you can destroy my unbelief. That when I ask, I have the belief that you will get me through this, especially when the trial seems so large, so out of control that you can't handle that you're just hanging on. That's where I find myself most of the times. I don't find myself succeeding through my own willpower. I find myself succeeding through prayer and looking at examples, praying in community, right? And that's where I realized two things, that only God can get me through this and that I need a community of people that I trust, that I can tell these things to who will pray for me. Because otherwise, you're just in this state of self-denial uh, and you're doubting God and you're doubting whether God even wants to help you or whether he can even help you. And so you are double-minded. So we are double-minded. So that was the first fight. A little bit more subtle. And the second is uh, we can read in verses 9 through 12. Let's meet our second opponent, right? Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away while, even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, the, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to all those, love, who thus love him, those who love him. So our second fight is with comparison. Now, this is something that's a little bit more obvious to us. If you have Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or Twitter or just plain go on the internet, right? Have you seen about, have you seen somebody else's uh, awesome new vacation? Have you seen any pictures of somebody's new awesome vacation recently? You know, maybe somebody had a better Valentine's Day than you, right? How was it? Was it better than yours? Did you get flowers? Did you get each other presents? Or were you just a little bit bitter, a little bit jealous, and a little bit annoyed at all of your friends? 
who, who had a better time than you. Now, this is not a condemnation for people who are going through this good time or happy, but it reveals our souls during trials. It reveals the state of our hearts, and it says that we are comparing, right? I know that when I graduated college, I didn't have a job right away, and I had to move back home, you know, I had, I had nothing to really look forward to because I just had to apply and apply and apply to college, uh, to work, to, to, for jobs. And I'd wake up late, I'd eat too much food, uh, I wouldn't work out, and then I would go on Facebook and see all my friends who'd moved on to better things, who had a job, who'd moved away, who'd moved out, and, and uh, I'd, fe I'd already be feeling miserable, but seeing all these happy people, comparing myself, I went back into this cycle of self-pity and felt even worse. It got to a point where I had to delete my Facebook account. I have a new Facebook account now. Uh, and I kept thinking, you know, I worked hard in college, right? I did, in I did electrical engineering. I think it's the hardest engineering, <laughs> right? And we had labs, you know, I worked hard. I got good grades, right? But why does this guy, this guy that I know that he cheated, he did not work hard, he barely passed and he has a job and I don't have a job. No, that is not fair. But that's what James is telling us not to do. He's telling us that we don't need to make comparisons with other people's happiness, whether it's real or fake, right? Because we need to focus on God to get us through trials. We need to realize our need for God. Everyone will have their own set of problems. And very, very few will reveal their real problems online. Very few posts you will see that said, oh, I'm struggling through this. Are you? No, nobody's gonna say that. They're just gonna post cool selfies on mountaintops, right? Or near beaches. That's the one I recently saw, so that's what I'm saying, okay. Uh, so I heard this great saying, it said, you know, if you throw all your problems in a pile and saw everyone else's, you would take yours back. Because you realize, you'll realize your, your, God has equipped you to deal with your own problems, right? So let's stop comparing ourselves, let's stop self-pitying, and let's fight to receive the crown of life that God has promised. And here we come to our second principle, doubt and comparison are the two opponents uh, we will face during trials and temptations, and they're the opponents that we'll need to overcome. So how are you fighting against your unbelief and, or comparison, and or comparison? What are you doing to fight? What active steps are you taking? And as we continue on to verse 13, we're reminded that the trials that we face that are supposed to bring us closer to God are not, in fact, sent by God. You know, we, need, we can't get this wrong because God cannot be tempted and he, is, uh, he, and he does not tempt anyone. So where, we ask ourselves, are these trials coming from? Well, they're coming from our own sinful nature and selfish desires. If I can break this down, uh, we have four basic trials that we usually uh, encounter. Let's see if it works. Yes. So the first one is corrective. It results from our sinful desires, and persevering in these trials will lead us back to God. These are the ones that we've already read about. The second are constructive. Right? These mold us to be more like Jesus. And some examples of these are being persecuted for your faith, being challenged by of your uh, being someone challenging you in your faith. And if you're in a bubble right now and that hasn't happened. All you need, if you're younger in your bubble, you just need to wait for college, right? Where somebody will challenge your faith, either a professor or a friend, or somebody you meet, right? But if you're outside and if you want to feel this challenge, all you need to do is go on YouTube comment sections or go on Twitter, find the atheist and challenge them on their thing. Call something out. You'll encounter a lot of good, con no, I'm just, it's not good conversation. It's really, it's really challenging stuff. They'll really force you to think, Oh, do I really believe this? Why would I believe this? You know, so that's uh, constructive and or constructive. Third is common trials. These are a little bit more common to everyone: sickness, uh, death, loss of a job. You know, and the final one is cosmic. 
these are more, more like earthquakes, hereditary illness, and other natural phenomena. What we realize is during any of one of these trials, we are going to want to believe uh, that we, what we want to do is better, that God doesn't know better, that we can have control over our lives, and that our will be done. But how often that is that really true? You know, we delude ourselves and lie to ourselves and fall into this opposite progression that's described in verse 15. It says, And we are dragged away by our own evil desires and enticed, and death enticed. Then after desire has conceived, conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And the principle that we need to understand is understanding the nature and source of our temptations and trials will enable us to choose the right progression. So here's what we are most of the time. Either you're going through testing and perseverance or temptation and sin. That's where we're balancing most of the time. You know, we need to realize, are we feeling, uh, are we failing and persevering consistently or are we sinning and becoming numb to our own sins, right? Are we, because you're only going through one of these other two, and you need to ask yourself an honest question, which path am I on? Because when we, re when we leave room for, for our desire to entice us, we open ourselves up to temptation. You know, shouldn't we know better? Shouldn't we know, if we're honest with ourselves, to not put ourselves in certain situations because you, if you pay attention, you know your weaknesses. You know where you're, where you struggle. And I don't know about you. I don't know if it's ignorance or if it's arrogance, but I know that I'm as guilty as anyone here. But that that is the tough question that we need to ask ourselves. You know, it says, how are you going to resist against the progression that's described from sin to death? What active steps in faith are you taking to battle against your sin, sinful nature? As we finish this section, you know, James doesn't leave us hopeless. You know, as we continue on to verse 16, he says, Do not be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of light, heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give birth through he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. James is saying that our anchor during trials and temptations should be in the character of God. That he is good and kind and merciful, and that every good and perfect gift that comes is from God. One of the things we learned in our youth study that we were reading, we're reading Reason for God, is that there's a thing called common grace, and it's, uh, it's something that God has given to everyone, and that's the idea that the planet that we live on, you know, where it's located, the sun that we have, the, the way the, lo the nature works, the consistency of everything in nature that gravity always works the same way, you know? People, otherwise, would we call this the laws of nature. These are a gift from God. You know, when we make it more personal, we realize that we have good, a lot, most of us have good families, parents that take care of us, provide us food, you know? We have cars to drive. We have good weather. We're in California. There is no reason for, for us to ever complain about the weather. You know, it's funny. It's people are complaining about raining too much. When three, four years ago, people were consistently complaining about not having enough water. And it's, it, it's yeah. Uh, so, you know, when we hear this, do we really believe that what we have is normal for the rest of the world? We just saw things about the mission trip. What we have is not normal. We should realize how blessed we really are. And this is just God, that God is doing something for believers and unbelievers alike in here. You know, what about God's greatest gift to us? What about God's sweetest gift to us? What about Jesus? Do we really believe that Jesus came to us because we deserved it or because he was merciful? 
You know, let us not be deceived. Jesus knew what he was getting on the cross when he paid for us. He knew that he was getting broken people that would fall and fail again and again. And yet, here we see another characteristic of God defined, that he is the father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows because he is not giving up on us. You know, he will help us in the midst of trials. He will give us the wisdom we ask for. And in fact, he has given us the Holy Spirit. So what reason do we have to not trust in his promises? James gives a, concludes this section by giving, by removing our reason for doubt and comparison when he says, He chose to give us birth through the word of tr truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. He chose us. God chose us. Right? Through all our deviant, childish, inconsistent uh, behavior, he chose to love us, and that is where we need to find rest. So we go to our final principle, and that is we need to rely on God's unchanging character as our source of strength during trials and temptations. And ask ourselves, who or what is your anchor in the midst of these trials? And how have you seen God's blessings through your trials? And we go back to our aim again and see the trials will come so count them all as joy because God is good. Count them all as joy because God is good and change your perspective. Be prepared. Be ready to fight. Do not be fearful or hesitant and sh reflect to the world, Jesus, when you're in, trial or, uh, when you're in this trial and let them see that you are different when, in your, when you are in your trials. That you are joyful because you know that you're becoming more mature. And you're persevering and you're reaching and you're looking to God. So whatever trials you're facing, let's not deceive ourselves. You know, let's remember why Jesus came to die. You know, if you need proof, you only need to look at the way the 11 disciples uh, were martyred. And the hundreds that got martyred every year for the gospel. We know that if, I know that, I know I asked you to think about something in the beginning and if you keep bring that up again, you know, think about that. You know that it is a painful time and that you need to, no matter what it is, for different, different things for different people, that you are going through either doubt or comparison. Those are your opponents, right? Or, or sometimes both. But you need to rely on the fact that God chose us because he desired us. You know, he already sent Jesus to take care of our sins, and he made sure we would never be alone. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 8 reminds us, Praise be to the God of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer griefs of all kinds. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You know, Jesus' ministry constantly showed us how to deal with temptation. In Matthew 4, Satan himself tempted Jesus. But Jesus trusted the scriptures and trusted the Father to lead him through. Every, if you remember, every taunt and temptation that Satan threw at Jesus, Jesus rejected by quoting the scriptures. Nothing of his own. He quoted the scriptures because Jesus did not doubt the Father's promises in the scriptures. You know, later uh, in John 13, when Jesus is about to be betrayed by Judas, Jesus knows that he's going to betray him, right? He knows that this is coming, but instead, 
Jesus washed his feet the same way he washed the feet of all his other disciples. And in Luke, uh, later in Luke 22, when Jesus is, Luke 22, 44, when Jesus is praying, you know, he, he's, uh, when is Jesus is about to be arrested and he goes to pray, it says, And being in anguish, he p- prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like the drop uh, was was like drops of blood falling to the ground. How many of you can say, how many of us can say we seek God that desperately when we're in anguish? You know, even though Jesus left, even though Jesus left, he gave us the Holy Spirit to make sure we would not be alone. And we need to realize that we, in our own ability, cannot stand in this face of adversity and trials. And we could never find strength to trust uh, without faith because we don't have the capability of seeing above the trials that we meet. So let us keep our eyes focused on the King while counting on the trials we are currently experiencing as joy. Thank you. Let's pray.